Hello, I'm Clem Cairns. On behalf of all of us at Fish Publishing, welcome to the launch of the Fish Anthology 2021. This is the first virtual launch we've had. Normally, we'd all be in Bantry, live at the West Cork Literary Festival. But now that the festival is online, it's great to be part of that and to have the 2021 launch enjoyed from the comfort of living rooms across the world. The Fish Anthology is a selection of short stories, short memoirs, flash fiction and poems. These are the winners of our writing competitions. The Short Story Prize was judged by Emily Ruskovich, the Short Memoir Prize by Blake Morrison, the Flash Prize by Kathy Fish, and Billy Collins judged the Poetry Prize. An enormous thanks to them for their interest in this endeavour to support and promote emerging writers. I'd like to thank the Arts Council of Ireland for their support in producing this anthology and indeed for their ongoing support of writers. And thank you to Sue Booth Forbes for her sponsorship of both the short story and the poetry prize. For the second place writer in those competitions, Sue provides a week in residence at the fabulous Anamkara Writers and Artists Retreat in Iries in West Cork. The 40 writers in this anthology are from all around the world and we are delighted to have gathered them together in this book. It's an eclectic anthology of wonderful writing and I'm proud that Fish has the opportunity to publish a book of such merit. These writers deserve their place in this anthology and they deserve a place on the literary stage. Many of them will be stepping into writing careers and I look forward to seeing their names on book covers again. Now, we're going to hear some of the authors reading extracts from their work. For the poems and flash stories, we get to hear the entire piece. It's a pity we couldn't fit all of the readings into this launch. but We do have another video on YouTube entitled Fish Anthology 2021 Launch Part 2. The anthology will be available on Amazon, on the Fish website and in good bookshops. You can get it in paperback and Kindle. It's an amazing read. So, from the comfort of your home or wherever you are, I hope you enjoy this taster. Kicking the launch off, first up, Winner of the Fish Short Story Prize, Mark Martin, reading from his story, A Correspondence. I'm Mark Martin, and I'm reading from A Correspondence. Dear Edward, there is such a feeling of unreality about the events of my last visit to Broad Oak Farm. It was as if I'd stepped into a sensational Victorian novel in which the virtuous son, now master of the estate and determined to preserve the family legacy, is suddenly transformed by some curse into the semblance of his wicked sire. And yet it was not fiction. You, whom I had at all times thought, should I write, imagined, to be loyal, gentle and kind, fell so far in my estimation it is hard to believe. A part of me longs to return to the farm, to find you just as you were, my velvet and decent mole. But I refuse to be one of those women. I will not split myself in two, trying to pretend that you had never been so cruel, nor can I forget that there were rumblings deep underground before the detonation. You had been distant and dismissive on my recent visits, even surprising me with your rudeness and oddly reluctant to leave the farm. 
perhaps you will claim not to remember what happened. I'm always doubtful of those intemperate men who distance themselves from misbehaviour by advertising to anyone who will listen that they have forgotten everything of the drunken night in question. I will not allow you that luxury. When I arrived at the farm, your father directed me to the green man. Looking back on my arrival, I can see that his adult brain was capable of picking up on signs that had escaped my notice. He could sense the coming explosion. Your ways must be familiar to him, and I can recall a satisfied gleam in his eye. My taxi had already left, and I was forced to trudge the long road into the village. In the green man, I found you behind a wall of empty glasses. You bellowed to me across the saloon and recommended that locals admire my figure. A smashing pair of pins, you said. What a bum. You stank of whiskey, and with half the village's male populace watching, tried to put your hand up my skirt as I sat down. Do you recall our conversation? It was quite edifying. You had always been rather reticent about your previous conquests. I had it in my head that I was something of a first. You put me right on that score. You presented yourself in juvenile style as a rollicking squire out of fielding, which is another way of saying that you confessed, without being aware of it, to being a sexual bully, using your position, modest as it is, to wheedle your way into the knickers of local girls who, without hope of advancement or travel, grasp at any faint possibility of improving their lot in life. I was ashamed for the both of us. After we argued, you departed, trailing unpleasantries that will echo in my memory whenever t some chance event brings to mind the many lovely hours we had previously spent together. With my luggage still at the farm, I took a room at the pub. Thoroughly humiliated in front of the landlord, a crony of yours apparently, since he insisted at length, and as if I were a fool, that you had barely touched a drop that evening. I would have built my life around you. But at this point, I'm grateful to be brought to my senses. I'm a wise owl and know when to take flight. Look to your father for a cautionary example and change your life. Goodbye, Constance. Good morning. I'm Greg Rapley. I'm coming to you from Grand Haven, Michigan. And the title of my poem is a Letter to Dowsey from Ruthke in Ireland. Driven mad by channel rack and fresh sprats in bad oil, sobbing on the oyster dock, at lowest tide I was rowed to the mailboat by a barefoot Carmelite, then lugged ashore at Cleggan and poured into the back of a singer sedan. I swore I'd suppress my affect for a splash on our way to the bug house and the good padre, having tippled with me in those dicey island days, found nothing against the faith in that. He meted out Kilbegans every ten miles or so, toasting each chosen apostle, excluding the Iscariot, but counting Matthias and Paul. As single pot prodigal, I found an easier, softer way, drinking buttermilk, noshing stewed apples and mealy fish cakes with the daft nuns and my attending physician, a kindly man who is the spitball image of Barry Fitzgerald. Walrus-like, I've wallowed in the hydro bass, as in our famous days at Mercywood, and thanks to my transatlantic laurels, my benzo calm and affable demeanor, I'm driven to a public house on session nights aboard the Moron bus and allowed two stiff drinks and the recitation of a poem. It's grand to hush the fiddles and part a cloud of pipe smoke 
led through the tavern door by four orderlies in white, as if I'm blind O'Carolan, stumbled, stumbled home at last, escorted by that squadron of virtuous angels by which minor deities are ushered into the world. On the wall chart of temperaments, mine approaches a shaker of dry martinis, sanguine with ice and three drops of melancholic. Dowsy, when did you last climb a honeysuckle trellis? When did you last scurry through an asylum greenhouse, tripping over clay pots and hashing your knees? I imagine you now as sea lioness, sleek and black, your most clever pup dropped carelessly, left to gorge on red dulse in a midnight sea, and you shrieking all those long, tumultuous hours atop a granite rock, eelgrass wilding beyond you in the surf. Mary Black, reading from Blood and Roses. Do you know of the Sarajevo's Garuja or Sarajevo's Roses? They mark over 200 places where people died during the siege of the city in 1992 to 1995. Concrete scars caused by mortar explosions in the streets were filled with coloured resin, leaving petal patterned markings. I saw the volunteers on television as they mixed goo in a plastic bucket, added streels of red liquid, turned a stick round and round until the colour spread, poured the mixture carefully. Over the years, these rouges have faded from a bloody crimson to a pale pink. There are moves to preserve and protect them. As for my time as a doctor in that city during the war, I won't speak about it much, only to others who were there. How did I end up there by following a trail of blood? I was raised to understand that blood does not have a religion, but people jobs, schools, businesses, neighbourhoods, and most other things did. It was simply blood and it was stored in a bank. As a child, I imagined a building with vaults of red liquid dispensed across a counter by white-coated staff. As a public health doctor, Daddy sat on the board of Northern Ireland's Blood Transfusion Service and brought me to see the main centre in Durham Street in the centre of Belfast. There, Serried fridges held blood in labelled plastic bags and the precious liquid was dispensed in cool boxes over a counter in exchange for paper slips. When the barricades were up for a long period or a major bomb went off, a call on the nightly news for donors ensured the vaults were replenished. It was my anaesthetist mother who for many years guided a life-giving trickle into the broken bodies of the conflict. In her 50s, she signed up for the lesser stress of a part-time job collecting blood, her work commitments carefully recorded in slim annual diaries. I have kept them. They record donor sessions in the schools, church halls and community centres of either side. Barricades were common and evening curfews announced with short notice. The Orange Order marching season each July caused disruption. Family consultations after the evening news predicted which roads might be closed on her road the following day. This default segregation required her to enter hostile territory. My mother shared her views on how best to spot a nervous donor who might faint, which clinic teams did a good job, and the quality of biscuits served at tea time. A well-run clinic stocked chocolate digestives and, as Northern Irish women have a great propensity for baking, an apple pie or scones might appear. Mediocre clinics had rich tea biscuits or nothing at all. North and South, Irish blood was, and still is, given freely and never sold, and for this reason is precious. 
a farmer's daughter, my mother hated waste, so when she found expired bags heading for the incinerator, she would take them home in her handbag and spread the blood beneath her roses, stopping first to say a prayer. What she did is no longer permitted, and it wasn't then. Still, Mummy buried the blood and her roses bloomed. We didn't talk about what she might have been if she were not a mother and a Roman Catholic, what doors and options might have opened for her in another place or time. We discussed biscuits instead and whether it was better to stay or leave. Hi there, it's Jack Barker Clark reading from Both On and Off. Both On and Off. On the phone to your daughter all winter. On the power of attorney on cloud cuckoo land. On the canal boat you once owned. On bravery, on ignominy, on trial, on fresh grapes. On the occasion of your birthday. On call if you need us. On amplification, on overreaction. On hold with the doctors. On display for one month only. On our best case scenario. Onwards and upwards. On lovely shiny wet new grapes. On modern medicine, on the contrary, on the one hand not so bad, on the other hand terminal, on assisted living, on your head be it, on the bedside table, there next to your reading glasses, on increasing medication, on a tour of hospitals, West Yorkshire, the surrounding Humber, on the formal bed, writing down what the doctor had said, on dyschronometria, on cerebellar lesions, on lovely shiny wet new grapes. On the ward, on the pillows inmates rest on, on demand westerns, on John Wayne on horseback on purpose, on the bathroom floor with the shower gel, on the bathroom floor with the shower gel following a stroke, on disturbing volcanic dreams now, on canal boats choked with weeds, on holiday in 1972, on ghost trains, on beach towels, on lovely shiny wet new grapes. On average 20 beats per minute, on life support, on your own, on top of the bread bin, on all sides surrounded, on the way, on the beach with Eleanor, on the borderlands, on the grass slopes, on and on. On Wednesday the 20th of March, on and on and then suddenly off. On behalf of those who knew him, on behalf of those who knew him best, on behalf of his grandson, unable to attend, on the Trans Pennine Express, writing letters to his granddad who had died. My name is Pavle Micha and I'll be reading from my story, Methane. A desperation came onto London when the nights got this warm. Unable to sleep, people would lie awake or take ill-advised walks. Some would give in totally and sit outside on baked curbs, talking across the road. Now and then an argument flared up and what in colder years could have been a fist fight turned into a quick, lazy stabbing. From up above in the flats, none of this sounded like much, but it was enough to keep the residents awake. In the morning, Tom watched out of his window as men squinted at tablets and sprayed the asphalt with green, orange, blue and white scribblings. Tiny arrows and numbers marked power lines, old copper phone lines, fiber optic lines, and every form of plumbing since record keeping began. They would hide in their air-conditioned cabins and then scurry out with spray cans in their archaic plans, repeating until the road seemed littered with confetti. With the markings all in place, they examined their work, hands on hips, and sighed. A day later, the hydraulic jaws of the machine ripped straight down the middle of the road. This was, after all, the path of progress. Some new data line was to be laid down, and if they tore out anything still useful, so be it. The aggrieved party would complain, they would pay the fine, and new lines would be run. If no one complained, good riddance. He was sitting at his desk staring at his monitor when it went dark. He noticed himself in the reflection, shirtless. With the fans, the computer, and the fridge turned off, his apartment felt supernaturally quiet. He could hear his neighbors groan in annoyance and outside the machines working and the men shouting. 
He stood by the window and watched as a meek, lukewarm rain started falling on the hard hats and the steel. He leaned out of the window to look around. On both sides, the neighboring buildings seemed to still have power. He could see TVs and fans. He took the bags of food from his freezer, emptied them into the biggest pot he owned, and put it on the stove, before realizing his stove wouldn't work either. With that sorted, he grabbed his phone and set to cancelling his rent payment. Even if the power came back in a few days, he wouldn't be able to afford it. The key in these situations was to stop paying rent as soon as possible. Evictions had been frozen for a few years now, so any cash you could keep was more useful than fulfilling any lingering sense of obligation to a landlord. The landlord, in turn, would stop paying the mortgage, but repossessions were frozen too. And so, every little tragedy triggered gridlock that cascaded upwards until someone said it was fine. Nothing you could have done. This is Matt Honer. Chemo for Corrine. I ask her what color the poison envenomating her veins will be, and she says clear, but we agree it should be blue or neon green, an alien serum meant to almost kill her in order to kill the tumor growing inside her skull, pushing on the backs of her eyes, crowding her brain, filling her sinus cavity, cloaking her ability to smell. The doctors say it is the size of a Snickers bar. By the third round of treatment, her body will feel it. Mouth sores, a tongue that tastes of mercury, vomiting, immune system dissolving, hair releasing from her scalp like the leaves from the oaks and dogwoods outside. After nine weeks, Dancing on the near shore of the river Styx, there will be five more of proton radiation fired through her face to shrink the damned thing further. We joke of Star Wars, Dr. Luke Skywalker, of Yoda guiding the beam from the operating room corner, staff in one hand, his other little gnarled hand raised in benediction like a little avocado Moses. Then, maybe, surgery to cut what remains out of her, and we laugh about Egyptian pharaohs, long nasal hooks, sarcophagi. I say damn thing because olfactory neuroblastoma belongs in a poem as much as it belongs in a person. Besides, I'd rather say Snickers bar, and we laugh until we ugly cry as we imagine putting her head in a microwave, melting the misplaced confection, chocolate, caramel, nougat, peanut chunks like nourishing boulders born by a sweet post-nasal pyroclastic flow as she tilts her head back to relish such a delectable gift. How she would simply get up from her treatment chair, walk out into the crisp daylight, savor the fragrant ribbons of spices wafting from a taco truck on the corner, the pungent harbor at ebb tide, the warmth of her own miraculous breath. Martha G. Wiseman, Dreams of Foreign Cities. I said, you're going to Paris. You said, yes. You were a little ashamed, at least I wanted to think so. I found the ticket receipt, I said. Where? On the night table. I'm sorry, you said. Oh, well, that's fine, I said. You can have the honeymoon you and I never did. There, I had said something that stung. It was unlike me, and you were shocked. Does it make you feel better to say things like that, you said? A little, I said, under my breath. Topi. What, you said? You had just put in your final weeks alone in our apartment, in what had been our apartment. I'd gone off to lick or perhaps to probe my wounds. You left in the morning, I'd returned in the afternoon and found the ticket receipt, JFK, P-A-R, JFK. It was under the lamp by your side of the bed. 
what had been your side. I'm always qualifying now. You'd come back to pack up some things. I never told you what else I found in the apartment when I returned that day. A love letter. Several sheets of eight and a half by 11 lined white legal paper covered with your pencil scrawl protruded quite visibly from a full trash basket. You could have emptied the basket. Instead, like a criminal in a mystery novel or on a television detective show who wants to be caught, you left the telltale clue. The sheets of paper balanced there at the top of the trash basket saying very clearly, read me, just like the little bottle that coaxed Alice, drink me. And I did grow small, dwarfed by your disregard and your lavish attention to someone else. I grew small, but I also grew hard like a bullet in my anger. I urged you to take my tattered pocket-sized plan de Paris with you on your trip. Perhaps I wanted you to have a constant and reliable reminder of me while you were there in thick happiness with your new lover. Me in your pocket as you and she tried to find your way. I wanted, I suppose, to inflict pain, but I also wanted you to love the city, to have the time you, well, we, had always hoped for, at least out in the streets where directions were clear because the little brown book mapped everything out and all you had to do was follow the markings. Now we are both foreigners. The city that was the two of us, if we assume we really built it and it was not a castle in the air, is once again a foreign place, distant, nearly unreachable, trite but true. Soon all routes into the city will have been cut off, not from spite or hatred, not because of a siege, but simply out of disuse. The paths are overgrown, the roads impassable, the city itself, a ghost town. Marriage was, for years before I knew you, a foreign city I never imagined I'd inhabit, a walled, fabled city whose gates would open at a password I would never learn. I wonder now if any fable is true to its own password, once the word has been spoken. Your words were persuasive. They carried me across the threshold, through the gates. I learned to speak a foreign tongue, though the fables had prepared me a little, as they do all children. I learned to accept a foreign tongue in my mouth until I could become more fluent. And foreignness was, for a time, transformed. I'm Shay Mark, and this is Cataracts and Dogberries. Thanks for the grapefruit. She's tapping to find the weak spot. My gift of books may as well be a sack of old newspapers. We play I spy with my little eye. She keeps saying I sty. I mistake cloudiness for mirrored light while she narrates a cryptic crossword from memory. You read her clue, then read her again backwards, looking for the subsidiary. Go back to the beginning. When I say I could exchange the romance for mystery, she inclines her head, asks, why have you not noticed the waterfall? I lay bare a hand-me-down mannerism, her closed lip smile, an imperceptible shying turn. It scribes against our nihility, but there are other things. Some allude to a reckoned weariness, hands cupping cheekbones, the fall of the voice in pitch. At the foot of the bed, a chart reads, kneel by mouth and not for resuscitation. With her kidneys shutting down, there'll be a flooding of the body, a thirst for air, an erratic heart. When she hears me sigh, she sits up, copies my Duchenne smile. She hands me a hundred dollar bill, explains how this is part of her last will and testicle. I let that slide to ask about the home of her childhood. Oh, it was a lovely hysterical house. You know, the one with the spinal staircase. I imagined polished whalebone, 
with its vertical articulations between the handrail and cantilevered steps. My thumb and forefinger trace over the knuckle wall on my left hand. She goes on to talk of how the house was haunted. Quite a friendly spirit, you know. But we called the priest anyway. Had it circumcised with incest. My mouth opens and all of her poltergeists swoop in. Out in the waiting room, small blonde girls are watching television. Hello, <clears throat> my name is Chris Weldon and this story is called The Fisherman. The man glanced towards her as she approached. He looked his 60 years. Wiry grey hair protruded from under the cap, matching the eyebrows which spurted over the sunglasses. A day's grizzle covered his jowls. Okay, if I just watch for a while, she asked quietly. She was standing about 10 yards from him now, beside the willow tree to his left. He didn't look her way again. Free country, he said, neither pleasantly nor unpleasantly. I was never married, her mother had said to her 20 years before as they had waited at the bus stop in Croydon. Did you never guess that? She had looked for somewhere to sit down, but her mother had gone on. Now that you're 16, there are things you should know, she had said, adjusting the buckle on her coat belt. It's why I had to leave Ireland. As she looked at the man by the river, she wanted to say, when I was young, I believed you were dead. But she said nothing. Her throat was so dry, she felt she'd be unable to speak. There was a silence between them for the next five minutes or so, as the man continued to play the line, jerking it in, then sending it out, sailing across the water. She looked upstream to where a dangerously dilapidated wooden bridge led across the water into an open field. A grey slate roof was visible above a hedge in the distance. The sky was patched with thin white cloud. A faint breeze coming off the river was welcome in the thick warmth of the August afternoon. She saw that the man's left earlobe came to a point, just like in the old black and white photograph. You fish? the man asked, nodding towards the water. Uh, no. I met him in Dublin, her mother had said. I was working up there, staying in bed and breakfast. He was up from the country as well, working on the roads. I met him in a dance hall on the Saturday night. Her left hand massaged the side of her neck. I gave him a dance and he bought me a glass of lemonade. Then the next Saturday I met him again. He asked me out, but I said no, I hardly knew him. She looked down the street. Where's the bus, her mother had said. Where's the bus? She'd been in no hurry for the bus which would take her from her mother and back to the foster home. What happened next? Well, he was there at the dance every Saturday night and he was very nice. In the end, I agreed to go to the pictures with him in O'Connell Street, I remember it was. Love me tender. You know, Elvis Presley. It was very sad. See those still pools over there behind the rocks and that one behind the log, said the man indicating with the rock. That's where they'll be sitting. And he flicked the line out again. Out of the flow of the water, so they save their energy. How do you mean? She stepped towards the edge of the water. Your old trout is a wily bugger. He always faces into the current, waiting for the food to come floating down. He won't use all his energy just to sit still. No, he waits in the calm of the pool and darts out to pick up the insects as they come by. Nothing more was said for long minutes. So why are you casting downstream? The man turned and removed his sunglasses. Those brilliant blue eyes, her mother had said. You'd think he was looking into your soul. My name's Pippa Goff, and the name of my poem is Don't Rush to Clean Her Room. Don't rush to clean her room and hope our loss can be dissolved by freshening up and washing down. Allow the bloom of her last breath to set on carpet corners and toothpaste stains to harden in the sink. Stop bustling in to sweep away the dust of skin from sheets or brush 
stray hairs from shells and sills. Ignore the powder tangle of her draw, her clips and combs and inky pens, the sweet half sucked, the scattered pills. Leave the mirror on the wall, her image undisturbed. It holds her in its silvered depths, her changing face from spring to fall. Now winter frosts its beveled edge. Cold grief has gripped us all. Some days I creep to peer inside, to catch her face, but still she hides. And all I see is me, then her, and me once more. Hello, my name's Francesca Humphreys and I'm reading an extract from my memoir submission entitled Schmaltz. Cleo and I speak five times a week. We video call or we text. She is always in bed. I am often in my kitchen. We have a cigarette together or several. We promise each other it will only be a quick chat because we both have work to do, things to write, ideas we have spent all day avoiding. She is in New York. I am in London. It is night time for me, late afternoon for her. Often it will grow dark out the window of her Brooklyn apartment over the course of our conversation. The sky will turn from blue to purple to black in that way that New York skies do, impossibly delicate pastel shades smudging together until darkness obscures them completely. We have been friends for 25 years, which is almost all our lives. She is neither a sister nor a best friend, but someone who resides somewhere in between. Our mothers are best friends. They are in many ways each other's mothers because theirs died young and left them motherless. Both Cleo's mother and mine recognize a kind of coldness and anger that resides in us, their daughters, a disposition that reminds them of their long dead mothers. We look like those unknown grandmothers too a slice of their faces present in our profiles. It is a burden to be so like a woman you have never known. There is something effortless about our relationship. We have had so many years for it to marinate. There is a fluid familial connection, a lifelong history, a readiness to leave certain matters unsaid, an understanding of the hurt we have each experienced. To me, she is more beautiful, more brilliant, more critically insightful than any person I've ever known. She is often the voice in my head when I am weighing up my options. She is the counsel I seek. We will likely be each other's mothers too one day, if the natural order of things is to play out. When we were very small, my hair didn't grow. Golden cherubic curls framed my face, but refused to grow below my ears. Her hair was waist length and deep, sumptuous brown. It still is. Mine has now caught up in an explosion of chaotic curl of many different hues. We are like the outfits worn by a girl band, the same fabric cut into different styles to distinguish us from each other. I remember being envious of her, the way her family felt like the magnetic centre of our lives, pulling my family in. Even the way in which her father's illness became the setting for our childhood. We would run and play amongst the oxygen tanks and complex cancer accoutrement. I was by her side the day he died. We were seven and not quite able to grasp the magnitude of so great a loss. We sat in her bedroom and ran glitter mascara through each other's hair. After a lifetime of friendship, we now find ourselves doing much the same thing. We are both students trying to turn ourselves into writers. I worry that she is better than me, more naturally gifted. She is quieter than I am. She always has been. And from that quietness emanates a confidence I am unable to emulate. We spend hours on these phone calls. I call her after classes and whine about how no one gets me, how I fear my writing is being misread, not considering that the problem may in fact be me. She soothes and comforts me. She feels like the only person in the world who gets the point of me. My name is Alexandra Blosier. My story is called Ouija. Unfold the board and place it in the middle of your dining room table. 
sit across from your best friend, the one you've known since kindergarten, place your fingers on the planchette, read the words before you, yes, hello, no, I don't know. Take a breath and ask a question. Don't ask to speak to the dead. They are far away and cannot hear you. Don't ask about your ex, the one who walked out one night after telling you he wasn't happy. Who's happy, you thought at the time. You will never get the answer you want and after seven failed years together, what is there really to say? Don't ask because he doesn't matter, not in any tangible sort of way. Ask instead about how light filters through the branches of trees, the thaw of frost from grass. Ask about the way the ocean is endless, or at least seems to be. Say yes. Hello. I'm Kate Lockwood Jefford, and I'm going to read from my short story, The Etymology of a Sword Swallower. He is directed to a hot tent with pallets stacked one end for a stage, a crowd on snaking rows of orange plastic chairs, the smell of mud and damp grass, of cheap booze, chip fat, burgers and popcorn, and something else, something tart and rich, adrenaline pulsing in the core of him, pouring through his paws. His new sword lies on a multicoloured bed of chiffon, a sparkling rhinestone studded hilt, 18 inches of gleaming steel blade. Alongside her he's placed an apple, red and polished as painted nails, and a salami, glistening pink and fat. He grasps her, licks her blade from hilt to tip both sides and holds her high, flipping his wrist so her tip points down to his lips. He's fasted 24 hours to ensure her path is clean, drunk pints and pints of water to sink his stomach lower, to take all of her. He rolls his head back, holds his body straight and still, slips her into his mouth and opens his throat. There's a short shout, a gasp, a shift in the atmosphere, its granularity thinner, finer, as the crowd sucks in breath. He has them now. He knows he has them. He pushes her straight down experiencing the pleasure, pain, of dead cold metal on living gut wall, savouring the sensation of all the rings of muscle opening up in peristaltic rhythm. As she enters his stomach, he lunges to one knee. She drops further, and he lets go, raising both arms, one, two, three, then whips her out. He leaps up and takes the apple, slash, slash, four slices, four. The salami, slash, 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 six slices, eight, ten, twelve. There is clapping, whistling. Something inside him is unshackled and swells, like a new pair of shoulders. He feels taller, wider, his step firmer. In the mirror, his features are more defined, his eyes brighter, the set of his jaw firmer. That night, he dreams he swallows the shard, strides across the Atlantic to New York City, uproots the Chrysler building, and swallows that too. Hello, my name is Maureen Boyle, and I'd like to read for you my poem, First time. First time. You walked me home that night in Dublin through the parks. Your Dawes bike had chased line between us in a night that always seems to me a spring. The time I liked the city best when Leeson Street was lined in cherry trees when I'd come back down from the colder north. In fact, it was January 
And we had just come from Lord John's, a nightclub where we kissed for hours hungrily, as if our lives depended on it, but now, walking, we talked with bruised tongues instead. You telling me all the saved up secrets of a boy's life and longing. The move to America, the disappointment when your parents didn't want to stay, your determination to return. We shared all of ourselves that first conversation, everything that needed to be said. We fell in love that spring in the little flat on Mountain View Road, with no view of mountains, but my desk looking out on a long garden, and the winter fu funeral of a poet once in an adjoining street. One day, after I'd given you a key, you rode home quickly to surprise me naked with a bunch of daffodils for Valentine's. We had to find the pill discreetly, but Dr Newman was humane behind her green Georgian door, and we waited sensibly three weeks for it to take, which made the event an event. I wanted to lose my virginity on white linen sheets and had brought them from my mother's hot press at home. We took a double-decker bus to Rathmines and stopped for a drink on the way, listening to the conversations around us. Two teachers back from volunteering in Africa, as if to distract from what we were about to do. It felt like a mix of Christmas and a trip to the dentist. The thing itself was a surprise, the shy manoeuvrings, the shock of fitting into place. Afterwards, I went to see a play, Christy Brown's life story somewhere further out from Ranelagh. I walked along the tree-lined street, sat awkwardly in the theatre, still sore, disappointed there'd be no blooms of blood on the linen, wanting to hang the sheets from the Ranelagh windows like a peasant marriage, hardly able to concentrate on the play because of the bigger drama that I wished there was a public way to mark. You would go back to America as soon as we finished Trinity, and I would cry the whole way back across the Atlantic, leaving you there after a Pennsylvanian summer and a trip to Franconia Notch and the old man of the mountain, Frost's County, the trees of New Hampshire already on the turn. And years later, one afternoon in the painter's high house in Hampstead, the communal phone would ring outside my room. Someone call me for a message and your voice would be there telling me you were to marry and that you knew I'd love your colonial Boston home and how you'd be in Ireland in the summer and that I would understand why it would be impossible to meet and I'd go back into the room and look out over a May Hampstead garden at the beautiful jays and the tall poplars and be glad I'd the more immediate loss of a Swedish lover to distract me. Mary Brown, from the middle of my memoir, Broken Lines, September 1985, Mexico City. Disturbed because I couldn't properly remember things, I went to my father's painted wooden chest, picked out his little plastic address book and began looking through the pages, something I should clearly have done long before, but hadn't. Of the Mexico City numbers, only one had an English name, Mike, the obvious first choice. As soon as I decided to ring it, my heart began a clumsy tread. But there was no answer, and no answering machine either. I turned more pages. The names intimidated me. Dr. Facera was one such, but I tried his number. A voice told me it was discontinued. There was a woman's unsettling name, Monica. I didn't try her number. I tried a Carlos Alonso and was answered by a mature man's voice. In my still halting Spanish, I told him whose daughter I was. His response seemed genuinely warm, 
if a little puzzled. I liked his voice. It had a dry fatherliness to it. I heard papers rustling. When I began stuttering for lack of vocabulary, he asked if I'd like to meet him and suggested next morning in the Café La Habana, five minutes walk from his flat, 15 minutes from mine. That was perfect. I had no classes on Thursdays. To achieve synchronicity, that was how he put it, he asked me to ring him next morning when I was ready to set out. He'd be there by the time I arrived. After I'd put the phone down, I felt no need to try another number. That night, I floated towards sleep as if floating towards land. I woke at daybreak in a violently shaking bed. My hanging spider plant was trying to whack the ceiling. It smashed onto the floor. Books, cassette tapes and glasses began diving off the shelves. I scrambled out of bed and immediately went sprawling over the tiles. When I did get myself through the door onto the little patio, I could hear the building site next door falling apart. The sound of scaffolding and masonry crashing went on and on, even after the ground stopped quaking. I sat at my little table a while, recovering, then swept up the spattered earth, broken off spider plant legs, ceramic pieces and glass. My satin nightgown was floor length. I kept tripping on the hem as I swept. I had a shower and got dressed. Time passed oddly. Somehow it was now nearly 10, a gray, dusty sort of day. Discovering my telephone line was dead, I took my address book out to the coin box on the corner. This phone was working, but no one answered at Carlos Alonso's number. I killed at least five minutes rifling the address book pages back and forth, but found no other names in it I could persuade myself to ring. Eventually, I tried Carlos Alonso's number again. Still no answer. I was going to wait another while and try again, when my gaze landed on the flats across the street. The eight-story building was half the height it had been. Three or four floors had flattened the ones beneath. Some sort of red and white striped upholstery oozed out from between the concrete layers, like stripy toothpaste spewing from a grey, disgusted mouth. Only then did I begin to grasp what had happened three hours earlier. My name is Sharma Taylor, and the name of my story is The Day Amy Kinona Became Invisible. I told Amy Kinona, impossible, who'd want to be invisible anyway? But the truth was, if I were her, I'd want to be invisible too. She stank. Her ribbons were always loose. Her uniform unironed. Her white socks yellow and hung loose around her ankles. Where do you live? She'd asked me the first day at my school. As I was walking home, she walked behind me, dogging my steps like a faithful but mistreated dog. I answered, up the road, but pointed nowhere. She nodded, as if she knew I didn't want her to know where I lived, but didn't mind. She followed me until the road veered left. I was relieved to see her turn down a narrow lane. This became our routine, and no matter how you ignored her, you couldn't keep her down. She just smiled. Weeks later, she started talking about becoming invisible. She came to our prep school on a government assistance program for bright, underprivileged children. Kids would play, ring games, and run from her, fearing some skin disease. Pretending she'd touch them, they'd fall down, lie flat on the ground and pray for healing. I never talked to Amy at school. I was there the day she turned invisible. After school, some boys cornered her behind the wall framing the grade three classroom. A group of them walked on top of her as if she wasn't there. Amy had whirled in the dust like a beautiful desert flower. I rounded the corner to see them fleeing like locusts across the field. Amy was on her knees, scooping up her books. Before I knew why, I was on my knees helping her. 
I told her to tell our teacher in the morning, but she refused. Amy said, smiling, can't you see I'm invisible? <laughs>